Um, I'm Kathy Oler. Uh, for the last many years, I have worked as an autism consultant for one of the large urban school districts here in Indianapolis, and I'm also a speech language pathologist. I'm Cheryl Boucher, I'm an occupational therapist, also at a large urban school district here in town, and have been in schools for a very long time, and also did some uh, little outpatient clinic with sensory processing disorder kiddos. That was so fun to do, but my passion really is in the schools and hopefully making a bigger impact. Um, but it's all a lot of fun. I also share I always that I have a Casey uh, nephew named Casey, who's a wonderful kiddo who is six foot four and a half now, and just graduated with a certificate of completion from Lebanon in Michigan, um, and is onto their central program, which they can attend till 26. And he can read like the wind, and he's good at spelling and a computer whiz. Uh, so he's got all these strengths, but the things that I know Casey needs is what kind of drives me to do what we all do. So I always hear his voice in the back of my head. So it's a, it's a good place to be. Uh, these are all related to talking about sensory supports in the classroom for all students. And as we talk, we will talk specifically also about some of our kids that we know have higher, truly sensory processing needs. But I'm always going to start with universal design when I talk about strategies. So I want to put those on the table first so we're thinking about it in that realm instead of just one or two children that I know need extra support too. So, and we know we have the diversity all the way from our life skills classrooms, which we call Thrive in our district now, um, more as an experience instead of a life skills class, um, all the way through high school and kids in gen ed, kids in inclusion, children who are in resource areas. There's such a diversity to try to get to in a short period of time. So please write us, ask questions. We love to answer back, um, have conversation. Um, we do a whole day on this subject, so there's a lot. Um, I want you also to be thinking about, um, as teens, what you can do. I know most of you have uh, several kids in your classroom that you're thinking of as we start talking. Get that little person in mind. I usually try to write them down and then write the strategy next to you, so I'll make that connection for when I go back. When we think about sensory strategy supports for all students, I want to think regardless of whether we're neurotypically, our brain is wired pretty typically, I have a learning disability, I have autism, I may have ADHD, I may have sensory processing disorder. We know the DSM was very close to admitting uh, sensory processing disorder as a diagnostic. It missed it just by a little bit. I do believe it will be coming back and we will see it as a identified disorder standing alone. Uh, whether it's a developmental disability, emotional disability, autism, we know there's lots and lots of needs, and some kids just have sensory processing problems. But we do know that all students, I'm talking about kiddos who don't necessarily have sensory regulation needs, they just are kids. They are just learners. They're just trying to do the best that we can. We all need to move, and we're going to do that a little bit ourselves. So I don't need to teach my kids, what do I need? What works for me? from a sensory component, from a movement, from a concentration, from my focused attention that I need to have for class. What works for me? And if I can teach my child to self-advocate for themselves in an appropriate manner, it's vital to their existence as they get older in junior high and high school specifically. I look at seating options. We'll show some. We're going to look at lighting and visual stimuli. We're looking at noises. We're looking at movement from alerting and waking up to calming down and deep breathing. And what kind of tools I need to support my writing. And so when I look at this, I say all students benefit from this. So what can I do in my classroom if you're looking at different things? Do I offer different seating options? Do my kids have some flexible seating? Can someone go over to a ball and sit and balance and self-regulate and listen? Can someone else be in a rocking chair? Could I allow a standing desk in my room? Perhaps I could have stations set up and children in the morning I feel like I need to unbind my desk and chair, no problem. By the afternoon, I need a big, deep beanbag chair to cozy up and be calm and more focused and know where my body is in space. So we'll get back to talking about some of these things, but get your, your mind thinking in that direction. So when I think about universal design for learning for classroom movement, I'm going to think aerobic exercise, big muscle exercise, aerobic exercise that target heart rate. I often tell the teachers will tell me they move. Kids move from station to station. We have collaborative learning groups. They're always up kind of way. That's wonderful, but that's not aerobic exercise. That's not getting my heart to target heart rate. And I have some slides to show you that is what the research supports for the prefrontal cortex, for executive functioning, for learning, for memory, and many other things. And then I want to think about, in addition to my whole class, I'm going to have aerobic exercise. I'm going to throw in some big muscle work. 
things that require push and pull and lift and carry. What types of exercise could that be? It might look like a wall push-up. Might someone else that might be carrying a stack of books to the library. But I have these things integrated for all of my students. I want you to think about calming, <coughs> learning, and organizing. If I have, you'll hear sometimes therapists will talk a sensory circuit. That they make sort of an availability of an obstacle course. But the main thing we want to get out of that is that I want to alert my nervous system, wake it up, jump start it, get everything up here fired up. I want to internally organize as my next step so that my activities should be organizationally, internally helpful. And I want to calm my nervous system. So the kiddo who ran around at recess, he was great. He got his heart rate up like crazy. But if he has sensory processing regulation needs, he may come in and just be just as wired as he was when he left, and I can't get him to calm down. So that kiddo, I may need to get him a heavy work activity. I need to work on that calming, deep breathing, some mindfulness activities before he transitions back into class, or with the whole class, because they all come in wired up from recess. So why not go universal design first? So he can keep with me. You think about how you are when you go to a workshop, think how you were yesterday morning when you started and you're all fired up and now I meet you this afternoon and we're <laughs> Okay, it's gonna be great. Have chocolate, we'll move a little bit. How do you feel though? What do you do to wake yourself up? What do you do to calm down? I love it when I see someone go to the back of the room and they decide they had to stand, whether their back is tired, whether they're just getting sleepy. And I respect that much more than falling asleep during the workshop. So see it if you need to. You get away from things, you get away from your stress. You talk to a friend, you take a shower, you pop a piece of gum or a mint in your mouth. You go out and get fresh air. You try to have time to take away the frustrations, the anxieties, the stresses, the overwhelm of, I can't do anymore right now. I've got to push myself away from my desk and go do something else. Food is wonderful. Snack, drink, tea, coffee, glass of wine is appropriate. I have to throw that in. When you think about the sensory lifestyle, you hear parents talk about a sensory diet, and I don't want it to be confusing, and they change some of the terminologies going more towards a sensory lifestyle. They mean basically the same thing, but I like the wording of the diet because I could envision this plate with these big three meals. I'm not talking food right now, although a snack could be a sensory piece. Three big meals, and we're going to talk about the pieces of those meals that stay in my brain and my body for about an hour and a half to two hours. And so just you'll have a, you know where I'm going. Big muscle activities, push and pull and lift and carry. Structured movement, getting that heart rate up. Good structured, good movement. And deep pressure touch to my nervous system. Very calming, very organizing. Those things stay in my nervous system a long time. So those are those big meals. And then I get little snacks that are sensory throughout the day. We turn off the lights and everybody gets calm. I give you a piece of gum. As long as I give you that gum, you start chewing, and that's organizing and perceptively input to your nervous system. If I light a candle, you may love it, and the smell immediately goes to your limbic system, and you're calm and more oriented to what we're doing. So those are little snacks. They last as long as the stimulus is provided. I give you a fidget, you start self-regulating, and you're okay. Take it away, lost it. But when I do the big meals, and we're talking more about it, that's what's going to stay in my nervous system longer. So that's why I want to even look for my whole class at how much I can get that in universally throughout the day. And we all have our sensory lifestyle. You start your day and think about what you do from beginning to end that helped feed your sensory regulation. Okay? When we think about sensory regulation, I just want you to think about this is the optimal level of arousal that I need to have sustained attention, to do a task. This is my emotion, my social, uh, my sensory regulation piece that feels just right. There is a homeostasis in my nervous system where everything is just calm, neutral, and oriented to what I need to do. And we're going to fluctuate throughout the day. And you, we've all found it. <coughs> Thank goodness lunch came at a certain time, and there's water in the back of the room, and we have a great treat in the afternoon. Those things helped us stay sensory regulated. Okay. We, we do this all day long. We provide our needs that we need, things we need, we do throughout the day without thinking about it. Probably most of you are teachers because you knew that you were not going to be desk chair workers throughout the school day and stay in one spot or in a job in front of a computer screen that isolated you away from other people. Not that those aren't wonderful jobs and needed, but we pick things because we are up and we're moving and we're interactive and we're on board with everything that's going on and we don't sit for very long periods of time. When I have good self-regulation, 
it helps me to be able to be able to make good choices, to not be impulsive. Impulsivity, we are teaching that word to our kindergartners. What does it mean to be impulsive? There's a great website that you pay for some things called Wonder Grove, and they have for your little ones teaching impulsivity, teaching self-regulation, they're little animated video clips that we're doing with social thinking embedded. Really nice tools that you can pull. But if I'm not well self-regulated, my impulse control, my making good choices. Why do we say, why did you do what you did? Which we shouldn't ask in the first place. But what were you thinking? I wasn't thinking. I wasn't regulated. I just did it. I, I just blurted out. You know, I hear more about can you help with someone blurting out in class. They're not sensory regulated. They can't control their impulses. So it makes it really tough. Um, this is, I'm going to move on a little quicker so we can get to some strategies. Take a look at this. This is in essence saying that whatever your memory was, whatever language was involved, whatever the sensory experience that you had before, when you're in that similar situation, you're going to feel it again. It may not be accurate, it may not be what everybody else experienced, but it was your memory, it was your experience. So when we see our students who have high sensory needs, who are very good, they went in that conversation one time, that was enough. It was loud, it was noisy, it was overwhelmed, people were touching me, I'm not going back again. That's their memory, sensory-wise, of what that conversation was. So all of those pieces that come in, smells that we experience, um, things visually that we see, auditorily and tactically, all make up our next experiences in life. And you can all probably pull from one. So the dentist's office is my experience of what happened one time was enough. This is to give you a visual of talking about all our sensory systems. And you look at touch, vestibular, perceptive, <coughs> visual, auditory, olfactory, interoceptors, gustatory. There's a lot of sensory. And that's why in an hour and 15, it's hard to hit every single component. So that's why we started with where we did. Think general universal design first. This is a great resource. I would share this with the rest of your staff. We want our children up here at academic success, the best student you've ever seen. He's on it. He's, his social skills are growing. His social thinking, he gets this. He's awesome. But I'm down here with my central nervous system. I've got to think biologically of sleep and hydration and food and medications and all these pieces down here. And with this is sensory processing. Because the sensory processing areas then impact greatly balance, coordination, using both sides of my body together, visual, motor, perceptual skills, eye-hand coordination, attention, focus, problem solving, higher level language, more and more and more up to the top of that pyramid of academic learning. But unfortunately, we have 30 minutes to teach, right? And so I've got to go from here to here. So keep thinking, when we think about sensory pieces, think about how I can have 20 minutes of quality if I took 10 minutes of sensory, great exercise movement, big muscle activities. And I'd rather have 20 minutes of calming or quality than 30 minutes of battle. So the calming techniques and the sensory and motor movements and all the activities are well worth the 10 minutes. Okay, sensory processing disorder. Some of our students will come to us with an official diagnosis of sensory processing disorder, but not very many. Have any of you ever received a student with that particular diagnosis? Not very many. But many of the students in our classrooms have sensory challenges. Picture your classroom right now. The students who seem to be tuned out all the time, they may have sensory challenges in the area of auditory processing. Think of your student who writes all over the page. He may have sensory challenges in visual processing. Think of your student who chews on his pencil. He may be sensory seeking. Think of your student who comes back from the restroom and steps across the group and lands on three kids as he's trying to get to the front of the room. He may have proprioceptive challenges. We'll talk about that in a minute. Think of your student who always seems to have meltdowns in the cafeteria. He may have olfactory sensitivity. That one's amazing. We'll get to that one in a minute. The important thing is don't look at the behavior first. Be a detective and see what's triggering the behavior and see if you can help set that student up for success by helping to regulate their sensory world. Okay, I'm going to go quickly through this because we ran out of time this morning. I want more time for strategies. This is looking at the work of Jean Ayers. She was the founder of sensory processing and sensory integration. It just gives you information. We know that estimated 5 to 15% of the general population struggles with sensory needs. 
And then we have an additional eight out of 10 of the children with autism that have sensory processing. Adults with autism were interviewed, and they said that was the most impacting thing about their autism was their, were their sensory issues that they were still dealing with. One woman shared that she had to get in her shower every morning with a really hard UVA sponge stick and scrub deeply a deep pressure touch to her nervous system before she could even start her day. Um, we've had adults say that when, um, now I know why my fifth grade teacher was always yelling at me, that that's how it felt to her ears, even though the teacher was speaking in a regular voice, her sound sensitivities were so great. And so the information that is available on sensory is overwhelming now when you do a Google search. So work with therapists and people in your building that specialize in sensory processing. To, you don't need a therapist to hand out a cush ball, but they're there to help you, you know, some really good strategies and make sure you're on the right track if you're in doubt. This is again talking all the areas it impacts. It impacts life. It impacts your life, period, and all avenues from home to school. We had a kiddo who his mom said that, you know, at school, this kid was fine. He was a smart sixth grader. He was bright, he was intelligent, he was doing great in school. When we talked to the parent, mom said, he is a nightmare at home. I can't hardly really deal with him. He gets off the bus and he is roaring. He slams the door, he goes to his room. This was a really bright kid who had Asperger's, who he was keeping it together all day long, the best that he could. And when we started working very closely with the teacher and the parent, and I'm not going to say because, well, he's okay at school. This is not, no, no, this was the child's whole life. So when we looked at parent, teacher, and the classroom day, we were able to put a plan together. This kid was eating lunch at 10.30. He was ravenous by the time he got home. The noise was on the bus. The only tip we had was he wore his jeans super tight because he was seeking deep pressure touch to a sensory system. And so I could go on, but you get the idea. Have conversations, talk to your student, get information from them. It's amazing what they can tell you. This I just want you to be aware of, that sensory comes in, there are different degrees under this umbrella. There's sensory modulation disorder, there's the sensory discrimination, and there's sensory-based motor challenges. And that's, there's so much going on that I want you just to understand of one kid who might show one behavior this time of day may look different in the afternoon that there's different components of this. When we look at sensory modulation disorder, we're looking at kids who may be under-responsive, over-responsive, or sensory-seeking. And we may see combinations within one individual. So it might not always be the um, same all the time, different environments, different times of days. So it's going to be very, very, very. Uh, but just so you know that, I'm going to go ahead and go on so we can Sensory modulation again, I should be able to tune in and regulate to what's important in an environment. So if someone is having a conversation with me and I really want to be a good listener, I'm listening to them. But I may hear some noise in the background that may be a conversation that I'm kind of interested in over here. And then perhaps I hear my name being said. And now I'm drawn even more. But it's that ability to be able to tune out and be able to focus and attend to what I need to pay attention to and get rid of other stimuli. And many of our students with sensory needs have a lot of challenges with that. Okay? All right. Let's look at the sensory area of touch. Touch is our first sense to truly develop. We've known for years that individuals with ASD often have touch sensitivity. They're either hyper or hypo sensitive to touch. But Touch sensitivity can occur in many of our students. Uh, and it can lead to some significant behaviors in our classroom. You may see touch sensitivity evidenced at season change. Why do you think that might occur? Clothing, right, clothing changes. Kids go from wearing shorts to wearing long pants, from lightweight t-shirts to wearing a jacket. With a student who has touch sensitivity, that can be a deal breaker. <coughs> It can be hard for the body to self-regulate that. And what you often see in the classroom is a behavior outburst. Kids with touch sensitivity often have trouble walking in line down the hall, especially when somebody bumps into them from the back. Same thing. It's touch. It's touch. At the elementary level, touch sensitivity often manifests as a meltdown. I'm sure these look familiar to many of you. These are some of the triggers for meltdowns at the elementary level. That can happen, obviously, at the secondary level, too. At the secondary level, it doesn't show in quite the same way. Oops. 
but it may manifest just as seriously when kids come into the classroom after passing period. When kids with touch sensitivity come into the classroom after pa passing period, you often see either anxiety or irritability. What's the environment like during passing period? Boom, boom, boom. It's noisy, of course, but there's a lot of touch going on there. With someone who's touch aversive, that can set them into a high area of anxiety and irritability that you as a teacher can see when they enter the classroom. Here are some, here are some signs that you might see that might indicate touch sensitivity in some of your students. I'm not going to read these, I'm just going to look at Sensitive body. If you have a student who squirms and has trouble sitting in the same place for many hours in the day or many classes in the day, it may be related to touch sensitivity. Try changing seating, offering, offering that student seating options. Same thing with holding a pencil. If a student has touch sensitivity, it may hurt to hold that pencil. Offer different items to write with. Alternate with a keyboard, alternate with dictating to a peer or a teacher so that touch sensitivity doesn't stop their progress, their academic progress. Look at all of these things. Tactile dysfunction can cause many of these things. What can I do about it in the classroom? Well, there are lots of things you can do about it. As you're walking down the hallway, this is a little student. If you have a student that needs to hold your hand and you suspect this child might be tactically defensive, let them determine how much pressure to hold their hand with. Okay, put your hand down there. And usually the little child will put their hand either on yours or under yours. If they squeeze your hand tightly, you go ahead and squeeze back with that same type of pressure. If they give you a fish hand, you give them a fish hand back. Generally, the student will show you by their own hand the type of pressure that is least aversive to them. Don't insist on touching. Don't hover over a child if you have seen signs that this child may be tactically defensive. It may feel like you're giving this child positive feedback. To a tactically defensive child, it may shut down the amygdala, their whole system, and put up their fight, flight, fright walls that cut down their learning, cut, up, cut down their neurotransmitters. Uh, let's see, let's go on to this one. Tactile strategies. Oh. Yeah. yeah. When you think about touch, so also when we think about our sense of touch, it was the first to develop in the womb. It's the first way we bond with another human being. Why do we swaddle a baby and hold them really close and snuggle them, and unless they're hungry or wet, they typically start cr stop crying? It's because I'm getting them deep pressure touch, and that travels through my nervous system to put them on parasympathetic response. And what that means is that I'm calm, I'm neutral, I'm organized, I'm safe. I can go on to do productive things, explore my environment, play, learn, whatever it is. When I have aversion to touch, I am put on a sympathetic response, and that's that fight, flight, freeze response. I, I, it's intended to be. We need it in our system for danger. But how many times somebody surprised you and touched you on the back lightly and you were deep in thought, and you jump and you're about ready to turn around and punch them. Or in the morning, somebody steps on the back of my heel, I'm going to be a whole lot more tolerant than if somebody does it at the end of the day and I'm tired. And why do we respond that way? It put me on sympathetic nervous system. i got to do something. Okay. So when we think about deep pressure touch, then think about how things holistically universal design in your classroom. Could you set up areas that just provide that for students, for all kids? So you have a cozy corner. You can call it your sensory area, your cozy corner, your safe place, whatever works for kids, the chill zone. That there's an area where there's comfy seating, there's beanbag chairs, there's a place for a big cushion. Maybe there's a maybe I can just lay on my floor on the floor to read books and look at uh, text, do my writing. When I lay on the floor, I gave myself deep pressure touch up into my belly, my abdomen, and my chest. It's nice, it's calming and organizing. I can get up on my elbows, which is really great as well. So there's lots of ways to do it. Now look in the classroom and see what could I provide that would be a cozy area. Or it's just a station and all the kids come over here for reading time and everybody has the new days. I am thrilled about the amount of grants that are out there that we can write now and they're not hard to do. It used to be so difficult for getting extra things in our classroom that we need. But we need to figure out how to make it work for all students and not just for our kids, at least that know that they really need it, but it's available. I'm trying, you know, we have one of these peapods. They do pop. I forewarn you, if, if a pencil goes into it, darn, funniest thing. 
more than the $35, but it's a great because it compresses and it squeezes the kids. So I had that in a regular classroom. It wasn't just for my special friend who really needed it. It was for all kids. They loved getting in there and compressing. So I got a new one, and we're back in business. Um, and just don't have any pencils in it. That's the rule I forgot to mention. Uh, but they're getting compression. He's squeezed. He's cozy. I have another student that I brought in, and the big crate or plastic bins that you could put for Christmas decorations, whatever you want in. He loves it. Another little boy has asked me 15 times for his. So we're sharing them. It is a big, cozy bin. It has a blanket in it. It has this, a little pillow in it. He gets and he does his reading. He even does his writing with a clipboard in there. So again, I, I've gone into a classroom, especially with higher needs. Everybody could have their own plastic bin if that's what a teacher wanted to do, or to make it a stationary, that this is the cozy area you can get in for reading time. It's not that difficult, I promise you. I'm having a fidget basket for all kids. We have had sensory seeking kids tap to me. They want to touch and feel everything. They can't self-regulate. So a basket of fidgets. The kids who don't need it, they're going to be curious at first, but after a while, they're going to leave alone. They've got other things to do. They want to get the work done. The kids who really need it will come back and ask and feel and fidget. Start with Velcro under everybody's desk. A little piece of Velcro, take, everyone can have that tactile feeling. It doesn't have to be a big deal again. I've taken small pieces of stretchy therapeutic tubing and tied it to the desk chair or to the legs. And I can have a stationary of that, and kids can fidget and self-regulate and tactile input and proprioceptive input without bothering other students. So there's lots of things to do. As far as kids are defensive again, now they're just fitting clothing, soft clothing, clothing that has been washed, things that are comfortable to our kids. Why do our kids leave their coats on when they come in? Why do our teenagers still want those their hoodies on their heads? Not that they all have sensory needs, but boy does it bring, it takes the darker part of the darkness, the brightness away, it eliminates extra stimuli, it's warm on my neck. So a lot of times we can't do that in school. So trying to look at other avenues of saying, you know, can we have, um, we've done beading inside a hoodie where it's got some weight in it, so the weight is hanging on their neck. We've got things where we have to put it in the bottom so they've got a little weight and beads in the bottom, the drawstring, so they can get a little pressure and calming for tactile input. Just by laying a weighted lap pad on a student's lap or something that represents that, it's calming and organizing to their nervous system. Lots of things we can do. And yes, in some of our more intense classrooms and some of my inclusion classrooms, I still have used weighted lap pads, pressure vest, weighted vest. We do a sensory brushing protocol, this deep pressure touch. With a, um, has anybody heard of brushing? Okay. Yeah. You're a little bit, I'm not here to teach you how to work closely with therapists if you're going to do it. But it's a very intense, great way to decrease tactile, auditory, any kind of sensory defensiveness in the child's system, and that's where I may start. I'm going to look and see what else can I put in place. Can I have a do a log rolling in the hall? And they're laying on their tummies, and they love getting those bean bags. And we're getting some good response. I don't think we need to do the brushing protocol. But I'm also going to make sure that if my child needs it, I'm a parent's on board. I want it to be done with fidelity. It's one of those big meals. It's going to stay in your nervous system about an hour and a half to two hours, so we're going to repeat it again. That brushing isn't just done by itself. We do joint compressions. So remember, we talked about push and pull, lift and carry activities, big muscle. We do those along with it, so keep that in mind. Moving on now, you talk, we talked about our tactile system. We're going to briefly talk about our vestibular system. It's incredibly powerful. And the reason you need to know it instead of just doing sensory strategies is if you understand your vestibular system, you're going to come up with more ideas on your own, and you're going to be on a better track than just randomly trying to do things. When we think vestibular, it affects our gravitational force. It gives us meaning to our world. What is right side up, what is upside down. Um, it coordinates both sides of my body together. It affects my ability to use my eyes and hands together to work, to read to text, to be able to write. It holds my body up against gravity. To hold my head and neck up, that's a big deal for a lot of our kids. If I have a kid with a poor vestibular processing system, it is a big deal just to hold my head and my neck up and sit in this chair for 30 minutes. These are our kids frequently that look tired, they look exhausted, they look like they're, I hate the word lazy, they look like that's what I'll hear. He's unmotivated, he's not even trying, I need to wake him up. Well sure, first eliminate the idea that he could be sleepy, he didn't get a good night's rest. But some of these children truly are not getting good vestibular information. Vestibular is again, within the fluid, within the inner ear, it's activated from the stopping and starting of movement. And so that's why it's important to think about also that movement-based learning and activities. There's a huge connection between my language center and my vestibular. 
And so I have kiddos who I'm trying to get more ideas and thoughts out and sharing, get those kids up and moving, and you're going to have more spontaneous conversations, more thoughts, uh, probably better completed, more complete sentences as well. Um, it, has, it affects lots of things. You get the idea. For equilibrium, you have enough balance. These are some of the ideas that you'll see that are problems with the cellular processing. From rest, restlessness, distractibility, we have kids that are jumping off of the highest, I don't know, the top of the rooftop if they could. They have no fear, they don't care, they don't think about danger. Well, then we have the opposite end of sensory, we have kids who are fearful of doing anything. They are gravitationally insecure, they won't go really a step, they won't try to get up onto the bus or down off the bus. All of that is vestibular. <coughs> so many different levels of it. We've got our kids who look like the energizer bunny and will not stop for anything after exercise and recess and so forth. And I really feel many of these children are saying, somebody please calm my body down. I need a deep pressure touch. I need my nervous system to be reorganized and calm and uh, feel safe again. These are ideas that if you do slow activities as far as looking at your classroom, if you have a rocking chair, that's slow, calming, organizing. If I do swinging, then it's more of a linear fashion. It's slow, calming, organizing. If I go faster swinging and pumping, I'm getting good muscle movement, muscle um, activity going on, proprioceptive input. I'm getting vestibular movement. I'm getting lots of good things. But if I want more organization, I'm going to do more of a slow. If I do rotary spinning and movement, and some of our kids can't get enough of it, that's alerting. But I have an under-responsive kid. You may see that kid who never wants to stop spinning, and we need to monitor that as well. We have other kids who can barely you spin one time, and they're dizzy, and they're upset about ready to fall over. So again, we have different levels of vestibular functioning for many of our students. These are activities, again, think about taking your class out for a walk, a run. Everybody standing up and doing jumping jacks, trying to jog in place. All of this is giving you vestibular movement. It's not a big deal. Everybody's going to benefit. Remember, we talked about the importance of aerobic exercise for the whole class, prefrontal cortex. <coughs> Getting up and turning on dance music. Anything that your kids will do, I would do it several times throughout the day. PE Central is a great source for academic <coughs> movement activities that are embedded, that they have really embedded in the academics. Go Noodle is a wonderful resource for <coughs> movement and exercise in the classrooms. It's like a hub of all kinds of resources. We're going to show a picture in a bit of move to learn ms.org. Move to learn ms.org. And it's a resource that is free. It's a PE teacher in Mississippi who does a phenomenal, fun job in the classroom. Um, if we had more time, we would have been doing one today. I encourage you, please turn it on when you get home and do five minutes, maybe not tonight, but do five minutes of it. Turn it on for your class tomorrow. The kids are engaged, they're up, they're moving, he gets you a target heart rate, and then he brings you down for the calming, the organizing part as well. These are some more ideas of ways to get movement and vestibular and good things in your body from a vestibular standpoint. Having obstacle courses, trying to do universal design, jumping on a mini tramp or jumping rope. We have an area for our kindergartners, and it's for any of our kindergartners who need an extra boost. Kind of in a, a cord or what do I want to say, like a back vestibule of the way the kindergarten rooms are set up. And I have a mini trampoline, I have a tunnel, I have a yoga mat, I have a hippity hop ball. And if I've got those kids that we did it in class, and this kiddo still needs an extra boost, and he goes right outside the door, and he knows from A to B to Z, the pictures and visuals are there. He goes from starting to wake up the system, alerting, organizing, I've got some bean bags, and the kids can toss bean bags. In the classroom, you can toss bean bags. If you have enough bean bags, and let the kids toss them back and forth gently to each other, pass from left hand to right hand, them just catching it, that's an internal organizing activity. And then my calming, that I've got my yoga pictures and yoga mats, and we have our life skills students are doing yoga. It's really awesome to see. And they're doing a phenomenal job. It's, it just, don't, don't sell anybody short is all I can ask you. Okay, when we think about position, we've talked some about that, I think we're good. Just think about the on this picture yeah. here. Um, anybody have a student with poor handwriting? No. Okay. One of the easiest things to fix is to look at the height of a desk. When I go into classes, sometimes sometimes I see kids writing up here, especially the short kids. I also see some of the kids who've grown a whole lot over the course of the year sitting on their desk writing down here. These are often the kids who fall out of their desk because they've grown a lot. For optimal writing legibility and performance, 
a desktop should be about one to two inches above a bent elbow. Okay, you don't have to measure it, but if you have a student writing like this, just know that not only will their legibility be impacted, but their persistence with the task will be impacted. So check and make sure their desk is in the ballpark of one to two inches above a bent elbow. No, while they're sitting, they're sitting. While they're sitting down. Just get your elbow at 90 degrees and then about it. Yeah, the so like where you are right now, just bend your elbow and see where this table comes to you. So that table will be a little lower than optimum for you. We're walking into classrooms and seeing kids who are not only writing, but trying to read text up here. And it it's just makes it impossible. Kids' feet are dangling. They can't reach the floor. And that's OK as a little sensory movement for a little period of time. But to sit all day like that, not that we just sit all day at school, but you know where I'm going with it. So if you make a, a life changer, it's not going to raise an IQ, but boy, can make a difference in their whole success for the whatever task they're trying to do. Yeah, make. they're willing to persist with a task is one of the biggest areas that you see. I typically, well, I, I have a little tool to adjust the desk, but if I'm in a hurry, I will leave stick of notes for my wonderful custodians who are great about coming around, and they will make the adjustments for me. I've gotten to the point anymore that I've got certain classrooms who just go and do a desk chair a check and see who needs some adjustments made. Worth the time. Okay. This was a um, quote from an adult with autism who said, It's like when your computer freezes when I'm on a sensory load overload because there are so many tasks open or a task is stuck and your brain hits control, all delete automatically. And in my case, this means sudden fatigue, balance problems, speaking problems, and disorientation. So it's, I love, I hate that they. They are walking this walk, but I love hearing it from those individuals who are adults who can speak and share what some of our kids can't say to us. Okay. The next area we're going to talk about is proprioception. We've talked about our tackle sense, all that deep pressure touch that's needed. We've talked about our vestibular sense, equilibrium and balance our sense that's activated with movement, stopping and starting, and needing structured movement. The next area that's really, really important is our proprioception. And proprioception tells me about where my body is in space. It tells me where I am in relation to another object or a human being, where my arm is in relation to my torso. It gives me information about how much pressure to use. If I'm going to hold a pencil or a pen, and I'm writing too tightly and hard, I'm making lines tearing paper, I'm making a lot of pressure, my hand's getting tired, I'm not getting a good sense of proprioception. Proprioception is housed between my joints that can connect muscle to tendon to bone. And so that's why when I talk about push and pull and lift and carry and stretching, it fires off those proprioceptors. Proprioception also sets off chemicals in the brain and body that make me feel good. It's like taking medication. It increases those neurotransmitters we're talking about, the serotonin, uh, glucosamine, dopamine, all of the good stuff that we need more of. So it's really, really important. Um, it's really involved in po my postural support, my motor planning. It works really closely with our tactile and our vestibular system. Um, vital stuff. And so when you see someone out in the hallway, like we were talking earlier, I had all of our kiddos that were going to the bathroom in several of my classrooms, but they're doing wall push-ups in the hall instead of swinging around and jumping around and doing all the things they do anyway. Let's make it purposeful. They can get good proprioceptive input by doing wall push-ups, and they're also getting some movement as well. Okay. When I think about kids that are craving, you'll see the kids that can't get enough. They want lots and lots of input, a push, pull, lift, carry. Then you have the kids who don't want to participate, and you'll see the opposite. What I often see in the classroom with kids, some clues that these kids might have proprioceptive challenges. Clumsy kids. Kids who fall out of their desk a lot. Kids who bump into other kids a lot. Kids who have, are slow to develop handedness. Those are all clues that this student might be having proprioceptive challenges. Do some of the things Cheryl said. Activities that include push, pull, lift, carry. That's how you set those kids up for success. Yeah, and I just that out of sync child. Carol Cranowitz wrote a great book called The Out of Sync Child and The Out of Sync Child at Play. And it's a great resource because it describes those kids that are always three to four beats behind. They, they can do it, it just takes more time, it takes more practice, and our world is moving way too fast for them. They may trip over their own feet, they may drop things that come out of their desk, they're on the floor. It's just kind of an accident sometimes we perceive that it's going to happen, I can see it coming. Um, these are some of the signs that you'll see it feel like um, and see when you see kids with poor proprioception. Again, if you leave with nothing more than think about, again, structured movement, heart rate up, big muscle activity. 
And that's what you're going to do universal design for your classroom. I'm going to get more and more into that. Who's going to do the job down at the library? Who's going to help with the cafeteria, the, the morning breakfast crates? Who's going to hand out those big books? I'm going to first pick my kids who need more sensory input than other children. Can the whole class take that seat, chair, push-up type of activity that I want, want everybody to do? Can we all just go out the hall and do the wall push-ups? Let's all stand and do jumping jacks. Keep thinking that's proprioception. That's going to get more and more into the nervous system. And again, it stays about an hour and a half to two hours, depending the intensity and the amount that you have given. That's just another more ideas on that. We had kids that were helping the custodian. They would wipe off the tables in the morning in high school. They were the ones that pushed the trash cans over to the other area. We had kids working in the library and helping support putting books on the shelves and pushing the book cart. Because so if you start to go down the list of jobs that are in a classroom and in your building, it, there's so many wonderful resources. It won't be hard. And again, go back to universal design of those just great, big, gross motor fun activities that all the kids can do. Okay. When we look at visual processing, there's so much involved. I'm not going to change someone's visual processing. We're talking much more than acuity. We're talking about things such as visual perception, visual detail, ocular motor, how my eye muscles work, my visual um, motor skills, my eyes and my hands coordinating to do something together. Sometimes when I do an assessment, I'll do a non-motor visual perceptual test, meaning that I've taken away the motor component. Oh, that was nice. Take away the motor component. And all I have now is looking at how is this child visually processing information. I may take away as much more of the motor coordination, and now they've got to do something with eyes and hands working together. And so there's lots of ways to look and assess, but the best way is to come in a classroom and watch a student and see what they're doing, because that's the functional piece of our job that I love so much more than a standardized test. That gives me one little snapshot, one little piece, but it's not the end all. So I want to look at visual perception from figure ground, memory, spatial relationships, discrimination. When we have kids that have a lot of over-responsiveness, you guys can probably tell me kids that are visually over-responsive. They're sensitive to lights. They're not queuing on non-visual cues. They're overwhelmed in their environment for many reasons. We want to get more to our strategies, so if you're OK, I'm going to move on so that we don't lose too much time. Same thing, under-responsiveness on the flip side. I missed all the clues. I didn't take in the information you were showing. I missed the lines on the worksheet. I know they're black and they're there, but I just didn't pay any attention to them visually wise. I, did, I needed a yellow highlighter to be marked on each of those yellow lines to show me and remind me. And I'm going to teach you to do it yourself so that when you're my step testing, you can draw your own yellow lines on what you need when it's appropriate. Okay? We've got kids who crave visual input. They have kids who stem and want to look at the spinning tops and really intense things. We have kids that are distracted by the particles of whatever the particles are out there in the sunlight. Whatever that is, they are watching those particles instead of zeroing in on your classroom instruction. This can impact, again, learning, reading, writing, and all of it. This is a nice quote, again, of sensory overload you have in your handouts. We go on and do some information all right strategies. these next two slides are some of the clues that you can watch for if you have students who you suspect may have visual processing issues uh, this particular one has one that i experienced when i did exactly absolutely the wrong thing i had a young student who could not would not go downstairs down steps looked absolutely like non-compliant behavior uh, Normal intelligence, normal vocabulary, could not, would not go down the stairs. In retrospect, I know this child probably had visual processing challenges with depth perception. Sadly, that didn't occur to me at the time. That was before I had done all of this information on sensory processing. But it's important always to look at what might be triggering a behavior rather than, right, than jump right to consequences for a behavior. I wish I had done that with this particular child. All right, some other things that we can do. I want to do a little bit of anatomy and physiology. In our eyeballs, we have rods and cones. Okay, the rods essentially are located on the outer edges of our retinas. And they are much less sensitive to movement and light. We usually use them for peripheral vision and for night vision. Those are the rods. The cones are located in the center of our retinas. And they are much more sensitive to movement and light. When a student has visual perceptual problems, hypersensitivity to that, to movement and light, they often do this. 
so they can watch the, the movement and the light with their peripheral vision using their rods instead of their cones. If I'm a student and you're talking and you're this and I'm doing this, what does it look like I'm doing? Exactly. It looks like I'm either ignoring the teacher or avoiding eye contact, right? It may just be because the movement and the light of our face is actually causing pain to that child and they can focus better on our words if they don't have that visual stimuli. Isn't that kind of interesting? Yeah, it's kind of interesting. Think of your students. Another thing I wanted you to think of, if you have a student that you suspect may have visual processing challenges, think about the lighting in your classroom. A lot of kids are hypersensitive <coughs> or hypersensitive to fluorescent lighting. Give it a try. Try using incandescent lighting or natural lighting in your classroom and see if it makes a difference on your student learning. It may not, but for some students that makes a huge difference. It's certainly worth a try. Another thing to watch out for, if you are having your students read paperback books, watch for bleed through. You know how on some paperback books you can read the print, you can see the print from the page behind? With our kids with visual processing challenges, that creates a figure ground kind of problem where they're sort of seeing both levels of print at the same time and makes it much, much harder for them to read. So be aware of that and see if you can make sure that the children that may have visual processing uh, issues don't have that kind of a reading surface. If you, if you suspect a visual processing, try on your worksheets, try taking it to the copy machine and try bigger print with less stuff on the page. See if that makes a difference. And I just want to add on universal design when you think about the visual layout of your classroom. Think about, again, if I turn those lights off, and get some table lamps or floor lamps. I've helped all my students for calming and organizing, and I can also help those kids really sensitive <clears throat> to fluorescent lighting. But also think about if you have kiddos, remember we talked under and over, that kiddos who are really under responsive, they might be falling asleep when that environment stays really, really calm and lower lighting, and they may need to have that alerting wake up all of a sudden that we need the lights back on for a period of time to get us charged up and awake and oriented. So it's, if you have to kind of this play detective and watch your class and notice where someone's sitting and what's working for so-and-so, what's not working. I know it sounds like enough, a lot. It's not that much, but it's just getting in tune to, you know, your kids. And so you'll discover that. But I have a really calm classroom that is a life skills classroom is very calm, cozy, but I have some kids who are under-responsive who are falling asleep and unmotivated and not working at all because they need their engine fired up. Okay, so just something to remember. Okay. If you have students who tend to leave uh, lines blank on their worksheets or on their tests, they may have visual processing challenges. Mark those spaces where they're supposed to write their answers with a yellow marker. It will help train their brain to look for this particular kind of signal. You can do the same thing with highlighting key words. Uh, those are both strategies you can use to help kids. The paper over there, if you have a student who writes all over the paper, this may help organize their handwriting <coughs> to have a yellow line where they actually do their writing. Having a green dot at the left side of the page and maybe a red dot at the right side of the page to show students where to start their writing and where to stop their writing is a good organizing tool for some students, not for all. But it's worth a try if you have a student who starts their writing in the middle of the paper or writes down the edge of the paper when they get to the edge. All right, let's move on to auditory processing. Auditory, when we measure auditory, we measure acuity and we measure processing. Acuity is what we can hear. That's what's addressed with a hearing aid. That's relatively easy to fix. You're not fixing the acuity, but you're addressing it in a way that helps that child be successful. Auditory processing is much, much harder. We have to be a detective to figure it out. I have a couple of quotes here of individuals with auditory processing challenges. When you get that handout, read these quotes because they kind of rip at your heart, helping you realize how hard it is to filter out the sounds. If I were to stop talking, there are all kinds of sounds in this room. Right? Okay. In a classroom, that's like a million times that. For our children with auditory processing challenges, that can be a daunting task. 
that can stop their learning and stop their academic output. Yeah, these are good quotes. Okay. Again, where'd that go? Yeah. There, we did that. All right. All right. Auditory processing. One of the things I wanted to point out is the difficulty hearing phonemic differences, differences in small sounds, like the difference between cat and cap, and the difference between school and cool, and the difference between man and men. For children with discrimination or auditory processing, that can be a very difficult thing to hear. Phonetic-based literacy programs are very hard for kids with auditory processing difficulties. That doesn't mean throw it out if that's what your district does. But if you have a student with auditory processing difficulties, you may have to supplement that literacy program with a whole word or a whole language program. So that child is not at a huge disadvantage because their brain doesn't process small differences between sounds. All right, these are all difficulties that students can have if they have poor auditory processing. These are some of the signs that you may see with students with poor auditory processing. There are a lot of them. These are some of the academic challenges that our students have who have poor auditory processing. Difficulty with WH questions. Asking a who did that and getting a where answer. Difficult for a lot of our students. Okay, a lot of our <coughs> students are under-responsive to auditory stimuli, and they look like they are tuned out. Be aware that it is not non-compliance. It's the brain working differently. It's something that in universal design, we may need to provide a strategy. This is another quote from an individual who says he hears everything and nothing at the same time. Be like if my words were the same loudness as that hum in the heating and cooling system. Auditory discrimination, that's what I was talking about with the difference between cool and school, cat and cat. Again, if you're in a literacy program that's phonemically based and you have a student, make sure you supplement with other types of literacy. Uh, auditory craving, these are our kids who are loud talkers, who are boisterous kids. Looks like ADHD. Maybe ADHD, <coughs> but it also may be auditory craving. Here are the big things that we as educators can do to help these kids. If you have a student who has difficulty with auditory processing, talk less. That's really hard for those of us who are teachers who like to talk. But that's the best thing we can do. Or if we are lecturers, like I'm doing right now, know that you're going to have to go to your student with auditory processing challenges and re-explain the directions using less words and or using a visual support, writing things down and putting them on the steps. Don't yell. We all, none of us think that we yell, but we do. You know when the kids aren't paying attention, well, we raise our voices, we yell. If you have a student with auditory processing challenges in your classroom, ooh, that's going to ramp him up, and that's going to set him up for failure. So try to watch your own responses. You short, direct sentences. Don't immediately repeat. Allow processing time. It's a real tendency for all of us, myself included, to say something, okay, write your name. Come on, write your name. You should be writing your name. Don't do that. Allow a little processing time. Oh, that last one, and then I'm gonna skip the next page. Limit background noise as much as possible. If you are a high school teacher, and there's a class passing in the hallway, or an elementary teacher, it probably won't bother you as an adult, right? I mean, I often won't, won't even hear that if a class is passing in the hallway. If you have a student with auditory sensitivity, that can close down their attention ability to you. So be aware of it. Close the class door. There are more there. Okay. Um, the next area, we're going to continue a little bit more on strategies. But before we do, I would like everybody to, I have to practice what I preach. We're going to do a short brain break. It's going to be really fast because I don't want to take much time, but you need to move. Kathy's going to demonstrate with me for just a second. I hate this. This is, this is one, two, three. If you've done it before, you'll be familiar with it. I'm going to say one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. One, two, three. Okay, you get the idea. We're going to do that for a minute. Then I'll say freeze. Then you're going to go two, three, two, three. 
got two. Three. <laughs> two, three. Two, three. Okay, you get the idea. Then I'm going to say freeze. Then we're going to go. Woo! Three. Woo! Three. Woo! Three. I hate this exercise. Okay, so, so one. One is going to be the clap. Two will be your woo. But just start out with one, two, three. Find your partner. Get really quick. Get up. Get moving. Stand up. Stand up. Stand up. You can't find your partner. Really quick. Come on. 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 We gave break, but we gave a brain break. We let our brain just get rid of all this. This is a lot to take in, particularly the second day of the afternoon. Our brain was just freed up, had fun. The other thing we did, we increased dopamine in our system because we had laughter. Laughter is increasing dopamine. Dopamine decreases the stress of the amygdala, and the amygdala will not let you learn and remember for the next few minutes. It's a win-win. If I look at focused attention breaks for my whole class, that might be that more of a focused attention break is more mindfulness, more deep breathing, and focused on my breathing. I might say, here's a stone each of you get, and it's very, in my opinion, smooth. Let's feel the stone, close our eyes. How does it feel? What's the shape? What's the texture? If I gave you a piece of chocolate, and we were all very quiet, and it couldn't bite the chocolate, we just had it in our mouth, a consonant traded on it. Being mindful means that I am going to be in the moment, I'm going to have sustained attention. And when I do these kinds of activities, it increases the executive functioning abilities. It actually increases my ability to sustain attention. Those pathways, again, get deeper. So the brain break was fun, and the dopamine is awesome. Let go of everything. And then the other is a more mindfulness and more intentional attention break. So all classroom universal design activities we can do. Okay. Back for the auditory component, just thinking about those strategies, universal design. Could your whole classroom have, um, if it's on linoleum, my art room has tennis balls under all the chairs. All the kids, for everyone who comes in that art room, no one has the noises and the scratching that most of them have in other classrooms that aren't carpeted. Uh, trying to have a microphone, I loved. I had a teacher who got a microphone because her voice was raspy and had was suffering a cold. And she found that all of the kids, in general, they were just tuning in them. They were focusing on her voice and filtering out the other noises in the classroom. She kept it. She uses it all the time until her battery wore out or she had to get a replacement. Trying to look at visual supports. Again, we talk too much. Take away the language as much as we can and provide more visuals. It's more tangible. Now, I could tell you 15 times what room we were going to go into this afternoon, but you were better off looking at the visual schedule and you were dependent by doing so. And we just didn't have to keep doing the verbiage. And when we have kids that are auditorily defensive, and whether they are or aren't, if they are in crisis, whatever you are saying, they are processing any of that language. It's not making any sense of anything. When they are in crisis, they are so wrapped up. And that, you know, for a regular little problem, it takes about 90 seconds to de-escalate. But what happens is that we stir the pot. We start talking. We start asking questions. We're going to solve the problem. We mean well, but we need to just allow some time. And our kids are so sensitive in trying to figure out what we're saying and what we mean. It's enough just to send them in the overload. Trying to use the microphone and visual support to check for understanding. I think so many times that we don't <coughs> say, did you get this? That it can be very explicit in your language. In another presentation, Kathy gives the demonstration. We need to say what we mean. Did you understand what exactly I just showed you? Do you know what the directions are, what we're going to be doing? And ask them to repeat back to you what those directions are, if they are able to do so. And again, reducing that background noise. I can't ask a teacher to say, you know what, we need everything off the walls in here. It is way too visually overstimulating. And everybody's going to have to stop talking. You can't do collaborative learning anymore because I've got three students that are auditorily sensitive. It's not going to work. I've got to figure out, though, how to help set up the environment so that my child can come in and be comfortable and know that they have the supports they need and they start using their tools. I like to say that they have their own sensory backpack that we can put headphones in. Put your in. We can provide some things. Uh, I tell a story about one of my students, and I'll try to consolidate it. That I put in the classroom with one of my favorite teachers, who was strong, very <coughs> strong in academics and everything, but she was a huge talker, and it was terrible. 
for the student. He crashed and burned the entire year in both academics and behavior only because she, her interpretation of the language rich environment was constant talking. So I would have that honest conversation about quantity and quality. You have to be really careful with that because you don't want to offend a colleague. I would praise for the opportunities and I would praise for the silences. We also have, um, when we think about the language enrichment piece that's embedded in so many things that the students are doing, but when you think about giving instruction and giving directions and supporting those pieces with visuals that are evidence-based practice for kids with autism, really, really beneficial. And also to look at universal design. I had a classroom teacher who had done all the directions that were typed through the Duke Honor from the Duke Honor to the Duke King. So she had all her instructions and directions, not just her lesson plan, but her instructions and directions were all on the Duquesne. I came in thinking that she had done it because of my kiddos who had problems with all the things we're talking about. And instead, she had done it as a universal design for her classroom because she was told that students need to be able to read the instructions for ISEP testing. And she was going to put in more strategies that were more visually induced so they could be more independent. So does that come in? Any other questions? And we got about five minutes. And please raise your hand if you do. I didn't. I hope I didn't sound like don't ask a question. We want to be able to answer questions. Okay. So we're going to go on to thinking about intro reception just briefly. And intro reception, you'll hear this word, and it's a little bit new for a lot of people, I think. And it's really talking about our internal senses. We're talking about our heart beating, my gastrointestinal system, my um, my love, my breathing. You know, have my sense of urgency to go to the restroom and go to the bathroom. You know, all of these are my internal sensory systems that also need to be attended to. Um, emotional response, sexual arousal, all of those things fall under that area. And again, we're going to have kids that are over-responsive and students under-responsive. But I really would like you to, to, to think about it, and I want to get to this slide very briefly, is I want you to think about the kids that are always going to the nurse's office. We go back one slide. Frequent trips to the nurse's office, anxiety, aches, pains, frequent trips to the bathroom. Now, certainly we have children who appear to be doing some avoiding of work at times, for good reasons, for good reasons. But think about the kiddos who are telling you that I thought they were hungry and then I gave them a snack and then they didn't want it. Um, she always has to go to the bathroom and she, it's constant, it's never ending. Constant need to go to the nurse's station, she says something is hurting. And what I would encourage you is to have conversations and explore deeper because we have students who might experience that something was wrong here. I don't know what. I think I'm hungry. That indeed maybe they were um, having constipation problems and they were having GI things that they couldn't interpret from a sensory perspective what the problem was. Does that make sense? The student, why I'm still not potty trained at nine years old, that I truly sensory do not feel the urgency until my bladder is almost ready to explode and it's too late. I'm not getting the sensory feedback that I need to get the feeling I need to use the bathroom. We've had kids who have been impacted and constipated with intense GI problems that are not getting those messages. <coughs> I frequently, if I talk about it, that someone's gone to the doctor, eliminate medical, other problems, I think sensory and stress and sensory defensiveness in their system and strategies we need to support that. So I want to plant the seed to just think that there's something internally, we had a kiddo with a broken leg walking around camp, limping, who did not know his leg was broken because he wasn't getting the right messages. He had a bee sting, I swear, this big on his arm, and no one noticed it until he did something where someone finally saw it. He wasn't hurting, he, didn't, he had no feeling. So be an investigator, look and find out if there's another reason that could possibly, certainly with some of the profiles of these students. Last thing I just want to hit on, I think we're about out of time. Think about Sue. Kathy and I presented at the Creek, uh, Kennedy Kruger Center a year or so ago, and I, we heard a sleep specialist. She reaffirmed things that we knew. We got to look at our kids' sleep habits, get the, the, all the tablets and electronics away from our kids at least an hour, if not two hours, before they go to bed. It is truly disturbing their sleep cycles. 
We know many of our kids, particularly with autism, do not sleep well and what that looks like. And so these are just some ideas of holistic things that you can choose and look at, from calming music to a body pillow to deep pressure touch, to having a snack and water next to the table, listening to quiet, calming music, teaching our kids strategies again that work for them, but please get those tablets away from them. It's not helping any of us before we go to sleep. So. I was just going to say, Cheryl and I have a website, IHateToWrite.com, and we have a Facebook page, I Hate to Write. And if you wanted to email us and ask us a question or anything, it's Cheryl at I Hate to Write and Kathy at I Hate to Write. So anyway, we would love to hear from you. Uh, with questions or comments or anything that occurs to you, we'd love to hear your experiences too. And I had mentioned at the beginning again, Autism Asperger's Publishing Company has the low cost, no cost, sensory strategies in the classroom. So just do a Google search, the article will pop up and give you a nice list to share with another colleague or yeah, it's a free download. Okay, on the article. You guys have been awesome. If you have